All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Caitlin Cook, and as you can see, I did my ELI on rape culture. So why an ELI? First of all, I did an ELI last year, my junior year, on free will. It was one of the best experiences that I've had in my high school career, and so I really wanted to do another one. I was also kind of exploring future career options because I plan on double majoring in anthropology and sociology, and this was a really good way to study those fields. Second of all, why rape culture? It's not the most cheery of topics. First and foremost, I'm a feminist. That doesn't mean that I hate men, it just means that I hate the social structure that's been put in place that puts men on the top of society. Also, this is a very important issue facing feminism today and the world. I also had a basic knowledge of the topic just from existing in feminist circles on the internet. So I had three goals this semester. Goal one was to study what rape culture was. Goal two was to figure out solutions to the problem. And goal three was an international approach in rape culture around the world. So for my first goal, I wanted to learn what rape culture was and is, why it develops, the roots of rape culture, and some of the consequences. I read some artic various articles and books about the topic, and I also interviewed people. First off, to understand what rape culture is, we need to understand what rape is. Rape is any non-consensual sexual act. It is an act of dominance and power over the victim. It all, rape culture occurs when a society normalizes, condones, and sometimes even glorifies sexual violence and rape. This mainly affects women, although men, of course, can get raped as well. And it disproportionately affects women of color, transgender women, and bisexual women. Rape culture is everywhere in American society. You can recognize it in the media, where sexual objectification of women is rampant. For example, the song Blurred Lines is about the blurred lines of consent and features many, many of its lyrics could be taken verbatim from rapists themselves. Rape culture is evident in rape laws. For instance, in Idaho, there's a difference between rape and date rape, even though the exact same crime has occurred. It makes date rape a less serious offense, even though the exact same crime happened. Rape culture is also evident in society's attitudes towards victims. This is called victim blaming, and I'll talk about it more later on in my presentation. Rape culture is also evident in how women are treated in the workplace and on the street. Street harassment is very common. Guys, catcalling is a form of street harassment. It's not flattering. In fact, it's really creepy and sometimes even scary. Sexual harassment also happens a lot in workplaces for women, and they oftentimes don't feel as if they can speak out about it because a person is usually of a higher, like, they're in a higher position of them with more power. Now, this is also huge evidence for rape culture. One in four women will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime in America. And of those sexual assaults, only one in four of them will ever be reported. And of those reports, only three in 40 rapists will ever be prosecuted. And of those, only one in 40 will ever be incarcerated. That means only one in three prosecuted rapists are ever actually put into jail. To put this into perspective, there's only about, only one in every 200 rape reports are false. This data was reported in the Washington Post, and the only criticism that has ever been leveled against it is that the false reporting data might be too high. In fact, you have a higher chance of being struck by lightning than being accused of rape falsely. One reason that many people don't report rapes is that victim blaming concept that I was telling you about. Victims will be shamed by family and friends and for instance, this picture here, this is what a girl was told by her family and friends when she told them about her, the crime that was committed against her. It also costs about $4,500 in this country for rape to victims to be treated. So if you go to a hospital and ask for a rape kit, it costs a lot of money and most people can't afford that. Rape culture has a lot of roots historically. Historically, rape was used as a weapon and it was used to show dominance over a conquered people. It's also very evident in mythology from around the world. For example, Greek mythology has a lot of myths that begin with the rape of. Rape culture also spawns from patriarchy. Patriarchy is a social system in which men are in top, on the very top of society, where men dominate society. Patriarchy arose at about the same time as agriculture and society. No one knows exactly why, but it very obviously happened. 
Another root of rape culture is objectification, specifically of women. Women are seen as objects, usually sexual, and this dehumanizes them. This makes it a lot easier for potential rapists to view women as objects and thus commit a crime against them. America also has an obsession with women's virginity. Non-virginal women are seen as dirty. This is a phenomenon, phenomenon known as slut shaming, and this is shaming women for having sex, dressing in any sort of way that is seen as sexually promiscuous, or basically having a sexuality and being very confident in their sexuality. Slut shaming is a big issue facing America today where women are often deemed sluts simply for having sex with maybe even just one person. Rape culture has a lot of consequences. For instance, victim blaming. I've touched on that earlier, but victim blaming is when the victim is blamed for the assault. Oftentimes, rape survivors are asked by the police, what were they wearing? What were you drinking? Were you drinking? And a lot of times women are told that they were asking to be raped. <laughs> the very definition of rape is that it is non-consensual, meaning that nobody asked for it. Nobody ever asks to be raped. It's a terrible crime to have committed against you. This is a reason why many women do not report rapes when it happens because they don't want to go through that sort of shame. Another consequence of rape culture is this idea of the friend zone. This is where a man can shame a woman for saying no and rejecting him for not wanting to be in rom a romantic relationship with them. This puts women in this box of just being a sexual being and not being any sort and not being fit for any sort of actual platonic relationship. Another huge consequence of rape culture is human trafficking. A lot of human trafficking victims are young girls who have been sold into sex slavery and that is a really big issue facing the world today. So my second goal was to look for solutions to the problem because as you can see it's very big and has many consequences. I wanted to learn about organizations and personal ways that I could work to end rape culture. I researched organizations and read various articles and I also interviewed some people about this as well. One very important thing to help to work end rape culture is understanding the idea of enthusiastic consent. Enthusiastic consent is basically a continuous sober yes. Basically this means that if you want to have sex with somebody you need to make sure that they are consenting at all times and that they are in their right mind to consent. This means that constant communication is, a, is required during any sort of sexual act. Anything less than enthusiastic consent is rape. So if somebody says no, or even if they don't say yes, that means that that is rape. Okay, one really great organization that's working to help end rape culture is called Take Back the Night. It was founded in 1999 by Katie Costner, who was one of the first women to ever publicly, publicly speak out against date rape. Um, it started actually in Europe as a Reclaim the Night protest in the 70s. It was a bunch of women's rights protests, and the slogan, Take Back the Night, came from a 1978 protest in San Francisco that was protesting the objectification of women in pornography. Katie Costner founded this organization with all of those historical backgrounds, and now she works with Take Back the Night to end sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and sexual abuse. She provides resources and help for victims and people in abusive situations. One really important organization is the Slut Walk. It's a series of protest marches that began in Toronto when a police officer <laughs> told women that to avoid getting raped, women should avoid dressing like sluts. This is horrific slut shaming and victim blaming as it puts all of the blame onto an assault onto the woman for the way that she dressed. This protest is a little bit controversial because it often features women who are wearing little clothing or clothing that is seen as sexually promiscuous, but it's all meant to demonstrate this idea that no one is ever asking to be raped no matter what they're wearing. Another important project is called Project Unbreakable. It started online by it was started online by a woman whose friend came to her terrified about what people would do when she told them that she was raped. So this woman decided that she wanted to start healing a healing process and provide resources for women and other people who are in abusive situations or who had been a victim or a survivor of rape. I actually had a picture from Project Unbreakable earlier. It was that picture of the woman holding up a quote from her rapist. 
it's mainly an art project that is meant to help jumpstart the healing process for victims and let them know that they are not alone. A more local organization is Alternatives to Violence on the Palouse. They offer 24-hour emergency services to anybody in Leita and Benoit County, no, Whitman and Leita County, sorry, and it's free to anybody in those counties. They are also very discreet, so that way if a person needs help, a little to no danger will come to them for wanting to get out of that situation. There are a lot of things that you personally can do to end rape culture. First of all, you can recognize that rape culture exists. You can also stop using degrading language such as slut, whore, etc. Language like this dehumanizes women and makes it more easy for them to become victims of rape. You can also stop making rape jokes. Rape jokes normalize and turn rape jokes and turn rape victims into something that you can laugh at. This dehumanizes victims a big deal and makes rape more normal in our society. You can also be critical of the media. If you hear a song that features words like, I know you want it, maybe you shouldn't buy that song and give money to somebody who obviously per perpetuates rape culture. You can also respect others. This is just a general life rule that you should follow, but it's a really big step into helping end rape culture. You can also help educate others as to what rape culture is and what they can do to help stop it. Right. My third goal, an international approach. I wanted to learn about rape culture on an international level because it is obviously not just a problem affecting the United States. I read a bunch of articles about this. One country that has horrific violence towards women is India. India has a very patriarchal society. Women are often blamed for rape and it, they're said to bring shame to their entire family. This was brought to light a few years ago to Western media especially when a woman was horrifically gang raped on a bus that passed through several police checkpoints and no one stopped it. And she later died in the hospital of the wounds that she received during the assault. But that actually jump-started a women's rights movement in India, and they started working towards solutions to this issue of rape culture and women's rights in the country. They're working for better rape laws and better laws concerning women. Another, this is actually a continent where lots of bad things towards women happen. In Africa, rape is often used as a tool of war. It's used for power and dominance over conquered people. Again, it's that concept that's been used for thousands of years. This is particularly bad in the Congo, and there are lots of charities and organizations working to help women in that area. Of course, this isn't happening in the entire whole of Africa, mostly just countries that are already war-torn, but it is very important to know that it's happening and also that it isn't happening in the entire continent. There are a lot of international issues that don't have borders. For instance, honor killing is a big issue that faces the world today. This is an extreme form of victim blaming where people believe that a woman brings shame to the family if she is raped and then she is usually killed for it. Another big issue that I mentioned earlier is human trafficking. It obviously affects the whole world and it is a big consequence of rape culture. Another big perpetuator of rape culture internationally is media. Western media has, bec has become a huge force in the entire world. And as we've, I've already learned, rape culture is perpetuated by Western media and we all need to recognize that. Right. I have a lot of people that I need to thank for this ELI. First of all, Gretchen Wisner for being a wonderful coordinator for this project. Carly Bean for being my faculty evaluator. The fifth period ELI class for listening to all of my horribly depressing stories. <laughs> my family for also listening to my very, very sad stories and tolerating all of my craziness during this whole project. And my friends for also being very supportive. Thank you for listening. so fast.